This WBTV High Definition Program is sponsored by Honda Dealers of the Carolinas. WBTV News at 11 starts right now. Tonight, Patrick Cannon resigns as Charlotte's mayor after FBI agents arrested him in a federal corruption investigation. Team coverage of the charges and his resignation. Reporter Steve Crump and Colleen Harry covering that. And what is next for the city? Brigitte Mack and Mark Davenport are handling the legal side of this investigation. What a day here in Charlotte. Good evening and welcome. I'm Molly Grant. It's been a shocker. Hello, I'm Paul Cameron. A lot of news breaking since we were last on the air with the story. And just in tonight, WBTV's David Spont sat down for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Mayor Pro Tem Michael Barnes. It's the first since Cannon's resignation this evening. David, what did Barnes tell you? Yeah, Paul Barnes and former Mayor Patrick Cannon, they have been close friends for about 10 years. Mr. Barnes told me that he actually spoke to the former mayor several times on the phone this morning, presumably before he was arrested. He says he's in shock. He says he's very upset by what happened. He says this news is taking a personal toll on him. Had a chance to speak with Barnes after and get his reaction after that resignation. He says he's looking forward to seeing where the city's going to go forward. But still, he says the wounds are very fresh. Take a listen. Yeah, I'm still um, stunned by it, and um, you know I feel really bad for his family and for um, what's what's going down. It's just all in all, it's a really bad situation for for all of us. And so, um, you know, I hope that we can continue to figure out how to move forward. We just had that conversation in the last 45 minutes. A lot of questions about uh, Michael Barnes's leadership. He's the mayor pro tem, but he says right now he's not the mayor. Charlotte does not have a mayor. He says they are going to pick someone in the Democratic Party. The council is going to pick that person to serve as the interim mayor. But Mayor Pro Tem Michael Barnes going to bed tonight, scratching his head, asking a lot of questions, and he says this is taking a very personal toll. Reporting live in North Charlotte, David Spunt, WBTV, on your side. WBTV cameras were outside of Cannon's home tonight as he arrived in this gold-colored BMW moments after delivering his resignation letter to the city manager and city attorney. Now to Steve Crump, who's been there as well since shortly after this news broke. Steve, you spoke with Cannon's attorney tonight. What did he have to say? Yeah, we talked to James Ferguson about three hours ago. That was when Cannon and his family pulled into their garage. But ever since then, things here have been pretty much rather quiet. A CMPD officer keeps watch, and there appears to be little movement inside the former Charlotte mayor's home. Patrick Cannon was seen in the back seat of the car driven into the family's garage by his wife, Trina. Their two children were also in the vehicle. Attorney James Ferguson delivered Cannon's letter of resignation. It's difficult. It's a difficult time for him. It's a difficult time for his family. Um, and in reality, it's a difficult time for the city. It's a difficult time for everybody. Two hours before, federal agents removed a computer and several boxes from the house after spending much of the afternoon inside. I think it's pretty disheartening, the whole situation, and uh, what's going on in our neighborhood shouldn't happen. I think it's a travesty. While some neighbors are critical of Cannon's alleged actions, others say they thought they would never see a day like this in Charlotte. Yeah, I think Chicago, New York, you know, L.A., but never Charlotte. No, I'm, I'm depressed about it, and I, you know, my prayers are with his family. I just, I'm so sorry. Boxes taken from the home may offer solid leads in the government's case. And attorney Ferguson says the mayor plans to stay quiet at least for a while. Uh, he's not going to have any statement tonight. Uh, in time, uh, I'm sure he will uh, have his say. So uh, he asked that uh, you respect the privacy of his family, his children, and I'm sure everyone can understand that in this circumstance. Now, Patrick Cannon recently celebrated 100 days in office, considering that he was elected back in November. But one thing to keep in mind, he may be the shortest person ever to serve in the office of mayor in record here for the city of Charlotte. For now, we're live in Valentine. Steve Crump, WBTV, on your side. On that note, Steve, the city of Charlotte is now looking at its fourth mayor in less than a year. Anthony Fox resigned last summer to join President Obama's administration. Patsy Kensington became interim mayor. Then Cannon was elected in November. Right now, Mayor Pro Tem Michael Barnes is handling the duties, but council will likely appoint an interim mayor. Colleen Harry continues our team coverage, and there seems to be a lot of confusion, Colleen, about what comes next. Well, I guess we'll wait to find out how the city council handles this. Patrick Cannon 
effectively resigned late this afternoon in a letter to the city to the city manager and the city attorney. We reached out to council members. Most didn't want to talk about the resignation, but council member Lawanda Mayfield said she's praying for Cannon's children. Council member Claire Fallon said it's a sad day for the city that this had to happen. By evening, the hallway leading to the mayor's office was empty and the office itself closed, no longer occupied by Patrick Cannon. The local boy who grew up to be the face of the city resigned effective immediately. Cannon said in a letter, in light of the charges brought against me, it is my judgment that the pendency of these charges will create too much of a distraction for the business of the city to go forward smoothly and without interruption. City officials say Mayor Pro Tem Michael Barnes will now preside over city council meetings and the full city council will eventually have to decide who should fill the rest of Cannon's term. Surprised, shocked, I'm gonna give Charlotte a bad name. I don't think that's good for us. News of Cannon's arrest circulated the city. Maybe we just need to wait and hear all the evidence that they have against him before making a decision or judgment, but I was very hurt. All in one afternoon, the sitting mayor of Charlotte was arrested on federal corruption charges, then resigned. If you're in that kind of responsibility and that power, you should not take advantage and you should do what you're supposed to do. He wasn't honest to the city, you know, he was betraying the city, so I, don't th I think it's good that he resigned. And city officials tell me that right now there is no timetable set for when the city council will meet to decide the next steps. We're live in Charlotte. Colleen Harry, WBTV, on your side. Now to the legal side in this corruption case. Brigitte Mack is digging into the affidavit detailing all the charges against Cannon. It's 42 pages long. And Mark Davenport is talking to a legal expert about what a trial could mean for the former mayor. The crimes that Cannon is charged with could mean a maximum of spending the rest of his life behind bars. Extortion, theft and bribery, as well as wire fraud, possibly 50 years. WBTV's Brigitte Mack has been pouring through this 42-page affidavit to learn just how the FBI claims that Cannon committed these crimes. Brigitte? Paul, I have been pouring over this all day, every free minute that I've had actually, and this reads like something straight out of a Hollywood movie. There are damning allegations that practically leap off nearly every one of these 42 pages. Right off the bat, on page two of the affidavit, we learn the investigation started in August of 2010 based on a tip and information received from local law enforcement and that it initially involved other individuals, although they are not named. It wasn't until 2011 investigators say former Mayor Patrick Cannon became the primary subject of the investigation based on evidence from several sources, including witnesses and undercover agents. According to the affidavit, much of the evidence against Cannon is based on very detailed exchanges between him and two different undercover agents that happened via telephone, text message, emails, and several face-to-face -face meetings. Several of those meetings took place in an upscale undercover apartment in the South Park area, according to the affidavit. The complaint alleges Cannon took at least five bribes within the past 15 months, totaling $48,000. Among those described in great detail, $12,500 in exchange for helping with zoning and or ABC issues for a proposed investment. After the undercover agent gave Cannon the cash, the affidavit says he placed the money near his ear and fanned the bills. On page 10 of the complaint, Cannon allegedly ended that exchange by saying he looked good in an orange necktie, but not an orange suit. Flip to page 28 and you find that jaw-dropping allegation that Cannon accepted a bribe in the mayor's office just last month where he was given a briefcase containing $20,000 cash. There is obviously so much more in this complaint, but one more thing that stood out to me on page nine. Uh, Cannon allegedly said to one of those undercover agents, I'm not one of those Chicago or Detroit type of folk, uh, type of folk or those New Orleans folk. Now that is ironic, given the fact that politicians in those three cities have been convicted of some form of public corruption. They include former Detroit Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick, former Illinois Governor Rod Blagojevich, and former New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagin. Live in the newsroom tonight, mm -hmm. I'm Brigitte Mack, WBTV, 
on your side. All right, good background. Uh, thank you, Brigitte. For one of the country's biggest cities, Charlotte has remained relatively scandal-free throughout history. No Charlotte mayor has ever been arrested. Tonight, we're digging deeper into the legal process to find out what a trial could look like for Patrick Cannon. Mark Davenport continues our team coverage tonight. So, Mark, what can we expect? Molly, we spoke to a expert on federal cases tonight. He told us to keep our eyes out for two different things. Number one, this case will move very quickly. And number two, the case against Patrick Cannon will be airtight. If you're going to use your office inappropriately, then the federal government is, is, is going to punish you, and they're going to punish you harshly. Brad Smith says the hammer came down hard on Patrick Cannon. Smith is a former prosecutor who has tried federal cases and knows the ins and outs of the system. Usually when you see federal charges, it's a pretty airtight case. And when it's federal public corruption charges, things are even more serious. When you're talking about an elected official that is voted in by taxpayers to, you know, to carry out city business, there's, there's nothing more despicable than when somebody uses the office for their own private gain. Good to see you. Smith says Cannon could face up to 60 years in prison and a fine of $1.5 million if convicted. But those are maximum penalties. A lot of people ask, well, why is it that this investigation was carried out over a four-year period of time? Well, the resources of the federal government employs in charges like this and investigations like this is vast. And so they don't usually go and make arrests until they know that they have the sort of case that they can win at. The conviction rate in federal court is very, very high. I think it's, you know, in excess of 90 percent. That's because Smith says most defendants plead guilty and avoid trial altogether. So these federal cases, they move much faster than state and local cases. Smith told us we can expect a plea here in the next few days or the next few weeks. We can also expect sentencing within the next few months. Reporting live, I'm Mark Davenport, WBTV, on your side. Thanks, Mark. Former mayor and current North Carolina governor Pat McCrory has known Cannon since he was a young man. Tonight, he's breaking his silence on this case. This behavior uh, cannot be tolerated. That wasn't all McCrory said tonight, sometimes angry, other times emotional. We'll share much of the governor's comments in about three minutes as our coverage of the corruption investigation into former mayor Patrick Cannon continues. Back now with continuing coverage on the arrest and resignation of Mayor Patrick Cannon. No, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked, I'm sad, and I'm angry. Governor Pat McCrory reacting tonight to news Cannon has been arrested on corruption charges. Cannon delivered his resignation letter as we've been reporting just a few hours ago. Cannon and McCrory are from different parties, but they have been close friends for a long time. And for the first time tonight, the governor is speaking out about the arrest of a man he once mentored. I'm heartbroken about what's happening. I'm angry at the same time. Reporters caught up with Governor McCrory in Raleigh this evening, and he told him how disappointed he is, not just in his friend, but for what this means to the city he once led. The city has had an incredible reputation for a long, long time about its high ethical standards, and uh, the city does not deserve that type of behavior. But the governor also has a personal connection here. He and Cannon have been friends for more than 25 years. Can you talk about your relationship with him and your connections? And, and He was very close to me and my family. Uh, my brother was his big brother and the big brothers relate in big brothers. I helped teach him how to swim when he was 13 years old. I'm just extremely disappointed and angry. When asked about recent conversations with Cannon, the governor said lately it was surrounding the airport, city business, and state legislation. And McCrory says he's concerned about what this could mean for the rest of North Carolina. This is a terrible piece of news for not just the city of Charlotte, but the state of North Carolina. While the governor says this is disappointing for the city and state, he says we will go forward. Pat McCrory says he's already been in touch with the mayor pro tem and the city manager to offer his support. You can stay with us for continuing coverage. We'll have the latest on the federal corruption charges against former mayor Patrick Cannon on the air and online on WBTV.com. Something we haven't given a lot of attention to yet is the forecast, but I know we're all interested. And we're looking at another hard freeze tonight. Here's Eric Thomas in the First Lake Weather Center. Yeah, second consecutive night with a freeze warning, second consecutive day that we only managed to scrape 50 degrees for the high temperature. The average high, 66. So when are we going to thaw out? Well, you know what? That's part of the headline. So the freeze warning again for the overnight. 
Warming trend will follow, but with it, some rain, perhaps even some thunderstorms. We'll let you know what part of the weekend you've got to watch out for. Meantime, here's the freeze warning. Piedmont, North and South Carolina, including the Charlotte Metro. Now to the north, it's going to be just as cold up here. The National Weather Service is trying to figure out, well, where has the growing season begun? And so this is where they drew the line. Of course, it's always hard to draw a sharp line, but you folks, again, to the north of us, you're going to be just as cold, if not colder. So if you have plants around your house, bring them in for sure if you want to protect them. Meantime, Charlotte, kind of the odd man out today, that number 43 degrees, because look at the rest of the surrounding communities, many areas already getting down to around freezing. And in fact, that trend continues across Statesville, Morganton, below freezing, and I mean way below freezing, all the way up there in the mountains. All right, so in the morning, I expect the official lows in the upper 20s. By 8 o'clock, we'll call it 32 degrees. Yes, another frosty start. So the seesaw pattern right now across the country, up we go with these warmer colors, the warmer temperatures, but the tail end of this cold air is hanging on. So let's look at those numbers through the day tomorrow. Okay, noontime already back up to about 51. That's warmer than we were all day today. And then upper 50s by late tomorrow afternoon. I think we can take a run at 60 for the official high and then 55. About 7 o'clock tomorrow evening, 43 in Boone and Blowing Rock. Okay, this is kind of fun. We're going to compare last week to this week, and you'll see some similarities. Last Wednesday, just like today, that high about 50, and then we bolted up over the weekend, and then we really came back down. How about 70s, 60s, 50s, and almost stayed in the 40s yesterday. Now, similarly, here we go. Today, Wednesday, we're going to rock back up to average highs over the weekend, but look what happens. This time, we don't come back down. We are going to stay steady as we go forward into next week. So this front, this is what we're going to be watching as we take you into the weekend time frame. Future cast, here's your clock. We're going to roll through the day on Thursday. Just a few high clouds out ahead of the rain that's developing along that front. You just saw it with our radar. This is going to continue to advance into the Tennessee Valley. You'll see it's not in a big rush to get here. Thursday evening, all day, you're going to be just fine. But we continue to track this now, the extended future cast. Let's roll through Friday. Different story. Already showers showing up in the viewing area Friday morning, but more concentrated during the midday hours. That continues to roll on. And then look, see that right there? A secondary boundary comes in here. It's another front. This one actually will have a little bit more unstable air to work with. So we're even going to allow for the possibility of a thunderstorm during the day on Saturday. So two days, showers Friday, storm Saturday. We clear out Sunday. So that's your better day of the weekend. And then the temperatures remain steady and nice through the first half of next week. So hopefully, if you have any outdoor plans, they're on Sunday this weekend. That's the way it is right now. Polly, Molly and Paul. Well, yeah, Polly, that <laughs> kind of counts. Molly. Hey, Polly here. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Eric. And we've got uh, D-Man coming up next. <laughs> Welcome back to Sports Bobcast hosting Brooklyn at the arena tonight. Big game for both teams, jockeying for playoff position with 11 games to go in the regular season entering play tonight. A great moment before the game as the Bobcats, Wells Fargo, and the Military Warriors Support Foundation gave a fully renovated mortgage-free home to wounded Marine Carl Morgan. Very emotional night for the Purple Heart recipient and his family. Darren Williams had the Bobcats in tears early with 18 points in the first quarter, finished with 29, but Al Jefferson was even better. 35 points, 15 rebounds on the night. Nets led it to half by one. Kimba Walker, a great game. 20 points, 12 assists. This would go to overtime, tied at 105. Playoff atmosphere here. In overtime, Josh McRoberts with the reverse jab. What? Say it ain't so. He had 12 big points. Then late in the game, McRoberts gets blocked, but the ball goes right to Chris Douglas Roberts, who drains the jumper at the shot clock buzzer. He had 16 off the bench. Bobcats won, 116-111. Washington lost tonight, so the Bobcats are only one and a half games behind the Wizards for the sixth playoff spot in the East. Charlotte plays Orlando Friday. NASCAR news, driver Denny Hamlin has been cleared to race this weekend in Martinsville after doctors refused to let him drive in last week's event in California due to vision problems. They first thought it was related to a sinus infection, but later found a small piece of metal in his eye. Once removed, Denny felt much better and has no lingering issues in other racing news. Matt Kenseth and his wife, Katie, welcomed their third daughter last night. He's going to race this weekend at Martinsville. Time to go inside the WBTV Prep Zone, sponsored by Town & Country Board. The Huff Huskies have a new head football coach, and he's Miles Aldrich. He comes to Cornelius from Spring Valley High School near Columbia, South Carolina. Spent four seasons as the Vikings head coach, and last year he led them to a 12-1 and record. Now, before getting the head coaching job at Spring Valley, he was head coach at Mullins High School in South Carolina, and before that, 
was an assistant head coach for 33 years at the collegiate and professional level with stops at schools like South Carolina, Clemson, East Carolina, Duke, and NC State. Also an assistant with the Buffalo Bills, so he comes with a wealth of coaching experience. Couple of updates for you for the upcoming Wells Fargo Championship at Quail Hollow Club April 28th through May 4th, 2010 champ Rory McIlroy committed to play this year today. Currently ranked number seven in the world. He's gonna be playing for the fourth year in a row. 11 of the top 32 players in the world are now committed. We're back with more news right after this. Okay, 62, your high tomorrow. So yep. a little bit of a rebound. Yeah, thank you, Delano. Uh, 20, or he's clapping mm -hmm. for the weather, actually. But tw uh, 68 down on Friday, and uh, showers in the picture, and maybe a storm Saturday. You thought he was clapping for you? No, I know. I, <laughs> yes, you did. I That's little, Eric. We love him. A little off here. Yeah. Thanks for making us your first choice for news at 11 o'clock. Sleep warm, sleep well. Thanks for joining us. Have a good evening. We'll see you tomorrow. Speak Out is an expression of opinion from the editorial board of WVTV and is presented by General Manager Nick Simonette. 39,000 tons, catch that, 39,000 tons of toxic coal ash recently spilled from a Duke Energy power plant into the Dan River, coating the waterway for 70 miles downstream. It also brought to light an uneasy relationship between the nation's largest utility and regulators at the North Carolina Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Concern over pollution from coal ash ponds Duke Energy operates on our state's waterways resulted in an eyebrow-raising fine of just $99,000 last year. Worse, there was no order for the $50 billion company to clean up the unlined ponds. Watchdog groups say that our DENR has been rendered toothless and its budget slashed and employees instructed by politicians to greenlight projects and issue few violation notices. We think it's time to remove the politics and make public safety the priority. Of major concern locally are two ponds covering 71 acres on Mountain Island Lake. Duke has apologized for the Dan River spill and says it is now committed to cleaning up some of its ponds but we're uneasy about who will foot the bill. Duke has long prided itself as being a good corporate citizen. Now would be the time to show that it really is. Tell us what you think. Speak out at WVTV.com.